Kitab Surang Gama, 25 Kaedah Mendapat Makrifat. Sasi diberikan dalam bahasa English pada 6 hari bulan April 2019 di Taiwan. Juga dikenali sebagai Formosa. Some new people today? No? Oh, you just changed the role, right? Ah, good, good. <laughs> How are you? Hello. Ni hao. We get. <laughs> really nice to see you sometimes. Yeah. Because you are the addicted. Yeah, <laughs> addicted to master, right? <laughs> yeah, always coming, no matter when. Yeah, and the food okay today, huh? Yes. yes. I give a message. I say cook a little bit more variety, and today is <laughs> a lot of variety. Will you enjoy? Yes. I say you don't come that often. Yeah, make a little bit more choice in case you don't like that. You can have that. You know. Treat you like a king, you know. The king they have a lot of food, yeah. But you are better than the king. Nobody ate before you. <laughs> the king have to have somebody to taste it in case it's poison. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's not logical that the king want to kill somebody just for himself. <laughs> in case it's poisonous, then that person die. Yeah. But actually, I think this is just a kind of prevention, huh? Because if people already know that there's somebody tasting before the king, so they wouldn't put poison in it. So that is just helpful in that way. <laughs> this don't do that much in my clothes. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Actually, when the food is good, even though you are not hungry, you know, not that hungry, it still you still can eat. But if the food is not good, even you're hungry, it doesn't <laughs> help you to enjoy. But you enjoy the food, yeah? Yes. Uh, no kimchi, but okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah, today I feel good. Today, I can eat the morning food. Usually, I don't eat the morning food. I don't eat the morning food. I have to wait a long time until I eat a little bit. Yes, normally they bring breakfast. Huh? They bring me one time a day at breakfast, breakfast time. But I could never, I could never enjoy so early in the morning. Yeah, you know? but today it tastes good. I did not mean to go out and eat. I just go out and bring my basket of food inside, and then I say, "Oh, something new. <laughs> Try a little bit. It tastes good. Not too bad." Normally I don't eat so much in the morning. Yeah, maybe the kanji is easier to swallow, but still don't taste good if they don't have something accompany. Not not good accompaniment. Then I just use some binker tofu, huh, or some pickle stuff and hot, you know. Yeah. Sometimes when I cannot eat, then I use a Korean instant noodle, hot, <laughs> very appetizing. <laughs> if I cannot eat anything else, you know, just to calm the stomach. To dilute the uh, the sour acid inside, yeah, and then continue living. <laughs> you still blending, yeah? From time to time only. You cheat now. <sighs> I introduce you as a blender. <laughs> okay, we tend to miss what we used to have since a child. It's difficult to quit. Yeah. You do quit slowly. Yeah. If you want to eat raw food but you cannot, then eat the raw first before your favorite. Then at least you have like seventy, eighty percent raw, and then the rest you enjoy. 
But after you fall, you know, with fruit and raw, then the other food don't taste as seductive. <laughs> and then you already almost full, so you don't eat a lot of that cooked food anymore. <laughs> yeah, okay? Yeah. Up to you, whatever. You eat raw? Huh? You had a fruit fruitarian section as well. The fruitarian? Any fruitarian raise hand? For how long? <laughs> I tried before, but it didn't last. <laughs> didn't last long. Whatever, we still need to eat something. Yeah. Buddha says so, somewhere in here. I caught it, but I forgot where it is. Maybe one day I'll find it. Yes. The Buddha said even be you, you know, need to eat to stay alive. Because we need to create a little bit affinity, yeah, in order to survive. But don't create such a big, troublesome, Affinity, that's all, okay? Just be simple, middle way. <laughs> that was a very big lecture, wasn't it? <laughs> very philosophical and deep, profound, all the way down here. <laughs> okay, now we're talking about the Buddha. Hmm? We should really thank the past, Masters, monks, and nuns, and scholars who have taken time to record the Buddha's teaching after the Master's Nirvana. And also for the past and present persons, lay or monks or nuns who have really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present, and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. According to Buddhism and the believer and the tradition, when you read sutra and all that, you have to put on incense, flower, you know, and bow to the sutra first and thank all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva in ten directions, all respectfully, before you read it, okay? And then you cover the sutra also with silk or, you know, beautiful cloth, and I just make it more popular, yeah, more easy, simple. And I apologize to all the Buddha. I say, if I've done something wrong, According to the tradition, my heart is full of respect. It's just that I cannot always do that. So please, all the sin, whatever I've done wrong, is all on me. At least other people, they hear the names of the Buddha. According to the Sutta, they will get benefit. Yes. Yesterday, we was already on the 10th method of meditation. Today we continue 11. Sariputra, one of Buddha's ten uh, foremost disciples. Hmm? Sariputra now arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, From distant cow paths until the present, my mind and views have been pure. Wow, imagine. All of them remember Kaupa's past, not just like last few lifetime or Qinglong's time, you know, <laughs> but many, many eons past, you know, countless of years or times, yeah? Many worlds comes and goes, they still remember. In this way, I have undergone as many births as there are grains of sand in the Ganges, again. Incredible. As to the various transformations and changes of both the mundane and the transcendental, I am able to understand them at one glance and obtain non-obstruction. Oh, you see, they have been practicing long, long, long time. Sariputra continues. Once I met the Kashyapas on the road, and I walk along with the brothers. 
Uh, they spoke about causes and conditions, and I awakened to the boundlessness of my mind. I followed the Buddha and left the home life. My seeing awareness became bright and perfect. I obtained fearlessness and became an Ahat. As one of the Buddha's elder disciples, I am born from the Buddha's mouth, transformationally born from the Dharma. It's just a way of speaking, okay? Meaning, the Buddha preached the Dharma, yeah, and then because he listened to all that, he became awakened. Yeah. But what a way of expressing things, huh? The Buddha's mouth is not for you to jump out from there. I don't think it's very respectful. <laughs> I mean, but probably at that time it is respectful, meaning all pure and all from the Dharma, from the teaching, that's all, okay? But the way they explain things, sometimes I'm not really pleased or not quite understand. Like they describe the Buddha, like his eyes like the eyes of the cows, his legs is like the lions, and his uh, f- form uh, something else. You know, all the animals attribute that describe the Buddha's, you know, like very significant <laughs> attributes of his physical greatness. But when you put them all together, you don't know what kind of animals is that even. (laughs) I read it too long already, and I didn't like it, so I don't want to remember. Because they say the Buddha legs look like a deer and his mouth like a lion. I mean, whatever the animals you can think of, they put the part and piece together to describe the Buddha. I know it is just symbolic, okay? Like to tell people that he's so strong, magnificent, like a lion, like elephants, and, and this and that and others, you know? But all the animals, piece and part, you know, like spare parts, <laughs> put them together. How can you imagine the Buddha look like what? Yeah, and I did not like it. <laughs> so I was saying a long time ago, when I was first out talking to the Taiwanese audience in my lecture, I say. Whoever described the Buddha like that, there must be Buddha's enemy. <laughs> Make him look bad. <laughs> yeah, because before we didn't have camera and painting, and not everybody has a talent to paint the Buddha to bring it back to their hometown to show it to people. Mm-hmm. Just like you came from all over the world nowadays. Not all of you can paint me. If we didn't have camera or video camera, you would not be able to paint my picture. Not all of you have the talent. Oh, please don't, because if you don't have talent, please don't do it. <laughs> Probably my nose will go to my ears, and my mouth will go to my chest. Who knows what your talent brings? <laughs> uh, so it's similar in the old time. Somebody tried very hard to describe the Buddha's image to somebody who has no chance to come to see the world on one physically personally. So they try very hard and they exaggerate it, you know, the way the Indian people do. Yeah. (laughs) They just love him too much. Yeah. So they just try to use the best whatever, the most significant animals to to describe him. But then when you put them all together, you cannot picture what a Buddha looks like. It's like very weird animals indeed. Yeah, maybe I find it and then I will tell you all the, the spare part that they make up of the Buddha, my goodness. <laughs> and then it's even written down, yeah, for the later generation to, to imagine. <laughs> Thank God nowadays we have camera. But even then, some cameramen are kind and gentle. They make me look beautiful. And some, uh, I don't know, they just try the button yesterday, just like me with my iPhone, don't know much, and then they still make my photo or my video. <laughs> and I can't recognize myself. I said, do I look that ugly? <laughs> so if the newcomer comes, they don't know where to find the master, you know? <laughs> because <laughs> one photo looks so beautiful and young, and the other photo looks so ugly and old and, you know, so distorted. Yeah. I make a joke before, remember? Somebody come and ask me, where is that beautiful Master Ching Hai? You know, ask me myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> or somebody else come and say, where is the Supreme Master Ching Hai? Is it? It's me. And they say, no, she looked uglier. <laughs> so, okay, continue. Sariputra. The Buddha asked about perfect penetration, as I have been certified to it, for the mind and the seeing to emit light and for the light to reach throughout knowing and seeing is the foremost method. So, I think he meditates on the light only. Yeah. See, nobody has a uh, cunning method yet. Not yet. The Buddha just preach. Yeah. And they just meditate whatever they have been meditating before. Or uh, the Buddha just told them, okay, you concentrate on this and that, uh, uh, breathing or whatever. Yeah. The Buddha did not teach them cunning method yet. Wow. And you get lucky. Jump in on board right away. No tickets needed. No building houses, no milarebates, nothing. Get the most generous master. Some are like that. Cannot even withstand one test. Test because they have problem, not because I wanted to test them. They have problem, and I check them, and I don't like. <laughs> this, uh, this kind is, can never go anywhere can never progress. Maybe the maximum is just a, a third level. Most people are maximum practice a lot, ascetic zone and everything, third level max, okay? And those who are too sensitive to their ego, carrying the ego all over the places, will never go anywhere. Just a lot of work for the Master and for themselves in this lifetime. Hmm? Because if you don't progress, you also have problem in your life. And then you blame. The master don't help you. You blame the situation, make you bad. You blame everybody else. Blame God even. <laughs> you don't look inside yourself, you don't clean yourself. That is a problem. If you want to learn English with the best teacher in town, you also need your homework, no? You go home, you have to do whatever the Master teach you and practice it and continue practicing daily. Huh? You cannot do nothing and then say, what? Yeah, actually I wanted <laughs> to have a joke like somebody came to a, the best English teacher, yeah? And what happened? He learned nothing. Some many months later, the, the Master make a test Everybody passed except that person. And the teacher say, why you don't pass? Like everybody else passed, why don't you pass? Huh? I could not speak anything. I could not write anything in English. The teacher said, why couldn't you write and read and speak? The person said, if I could, then I wouldn't have come here to study with you. <laughs> you know, like hula, hula, hop. <laughs> Yeah, speaking English now. Yeah. <laughs> if I could speak, <laughs> read and write, then I wouldn't have come to you. <laughs> this is a problem. It sounds funny to you and illogical, right? But this is what people do. That's what they're thinking, and that's how they behave. Even among some of so-called disciples, my so-called disciples here, they have legs, but they don't want to walk. Yeah? And then the master needs to carry them all the time. You shouldn't do that. Then your legs will kaput. Yeah? One time I was in the hospital. There were, next to me there was one old lady. Huh? She's Italian. And they don't let her walk out or anything. And because I could not move, and at that time I could not move, and it hurts everywhere when I move, so they think I also have a nerves <laughs> problem. <laughs> they put me together in the same ward, while testing, yeah? Anyway, every day she called my name, she made me do this, do that. I help her in any way, because I thought she's handicapped. She couldn't climb out, couldn't do anything. Yeah, because, I don't know, I'm so nice to people, so she asked me to do this, do that for her. And can she use my tower? Can she use my 
a bathrobe, etc., etc. Let's give it all to her. Doesn't matter. Whatever. Yeah. Otherwise, he keep talking forever. <laughs> but it's not as funny as it sounds now. You see, if she go down and clean her teeth, she never close the tap. If she clean her teeth, for example, they help her to go down and then she clean teeth. And then they, they put her in a bed, you know, she, she never close the tap. <laughs> I have to go and close it, for example. So I said to her, you must close the tap, you know, she speaks in French. And I speak uh, half Italian. <laughs> half of the sentence. <laughs> we understood each other okay. Especially I understood her. <laughs> I don't need language to understand her. She just demands all kinds of things. I want to talk to you even though if you don't understand, she just keeps talking, calling your name until you have to get up. Either talk to her or go out of the room. So this lady, she's laying in bed all day, eating, you know, or talking to herself or, or to my ears, anything. And now and then ring the bell, just so the bother the nurses, they all hated her. <laughs> they don't want to have anything to do with her. Some sort she ring all the time, they don't come, you know? And then I have to do whatever she wants, etc. And then I thought she's handicapped, she couldn't walk, yeah? So I help her a lot in my situation, whatever I can. Now, this lady, she's really something. <laughs> she can speak French, Italian, perfect, you know? And sometimes, because she can express very accurately, I was surprised, yeah. And sometimes I cannot bend down to pick up things, and if I drop something, I use my toe, you know? I use my toe to pick up from the floor. And she look at she say, oh, phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, imagine she can express like that. Well, I don't know what's wrong. I had no idea in this. So I keep helping her, and then she has a lot of friends and family coming all the time. And they just stand in towering over her and talk, 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 and then leave. And one day, her son came in. Her son was a doctor even, yeah? So he speaks French very well. I was thinking, I should talk to him, you know, one, one day. Maybe he worked far away, so he didn't come every day. Only that day he came. I said to him, you know, you have many uh, French relatives coming here to see your mother, but she's in this bed all the time. Uh, you, you better tell them to, every time they come, just uh, help her on both sides of her arms and make her walk around the hospital. Otherwise, it's continue like this, her legs will lose the ability, yeah, the muscle to walk. So from then on, they do that. Oh, thank God, I was so happy whenever they come because <laughs> they take her out, you know, and I don't have to listen to her radio all day long. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's good for her also. It wa I wasn't thinking of me. I was thinking of her, you know? Because when I saw the nurses take her out of bed so that they can clean the bed and change the bed, I saw she can, she can walk with them. So I told him that. And from then on, they, they come in and not just blah, 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 but take her out for a walk in the corridor and all that. She could walk even. She don't even need that. She just loved it. One day I tested her, she just ran to me. Yeah. <laughs> If you give her some favorite stuff, oh, she come to you. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. So from then on, they keep doing that. Some people, they're not handicapped, just don't want to do things. You must do it, okay? It's your duty to yourselves and to your five generations, as well as to the world. Be a hero, okay? Be a hero. Rely on yourself and help others. Hmm? not just rely on master all the time. Like if you're a baby, then your mother feed you milk, yeah, and uh, uh, liquid food. But when you're growing up, you chew, man, you chew, okay? <laughs> and you learn to walk, learn to talk, and then you can learn to be of use in the society. That's what we should do, okay? Mm. That's why we have to keep our dignity, yeah? do our job. Whatever job, we do it perfect, as perfect as we can, and the spiritual practice we do as best as we can. Yeah? Don't make any excuse to slow down yourself and make trouble for yourself and for other people. Mm? you are grown up, no? Grown up. Even children, they practice well. Mm. All right, so now, that's what he thinks, yeah? 
after he concentrated on the talking of the Buddha of those long time, a couple hours ago, these two uh, uh, other monks outside on the street, then he see the light, maybe concentrating, see the light. So he think that uh, knowing, meaning listening to the teaching, then he have knowledge about spiritual practice. And then seeing inside, you see, knowing and seeing is the foremost method. Knowing, because the Buddha teach him uh, all these cowpaths ago, he met a good spiritual friend teaching him, and intellectually he know things. He understand the spiritual practice. And then seeing, meaning maybe at that time these um, spiritual friends teach them to concentrate, to look inside. Yeah? And the Buddha at that time also probably teach him how to meditate and see, okay, from the in, inside eye. So he said that's the best method, hmm? learning the theory and looking inward, yeah, best. Now, we have the next one, universal worthy Bodhisattva, that's his name, arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha, I have been a Dharma prince, with as many thirst come ones as there are sands in the Ganges. Whew. And still did not become Buddha yet, with so many Buddhas learning so many. What's wrong? I want to know what's wrong. <laughs> the thirst come ones, meaning many, yeah? Yeah. Of the ten directions, tell the disciples who have the roots of a Bodhisattva to cultivate the universal worthy conduct, which is named after me. Wow, big shot. Huh? His name is universal worthy, and many uh, conduct have been named after him. Were honor one, meaning the Buddha, Sekamoni Buddha, I use my mind to listen and distinguish the knowledge and views of living beings. In other regions, as many realms away as there are sands in the Ganges, if there is any living being who discovers the conduct of universal worthy, I immediately mount my six tusk elephant and create hundreds of thousands of reduplicated bodies, transcendental bodies, transformation bodies, yes. Not a physical, but can be in many places at the same time. Uh, reduplicated bodies, which go to those places, although their obstacles may be so heavy that they do not see me, I secretly rub their crowns, protect and comfort them, and help them be successful. Successful in cultivating the universal worthy conduct. There are two kinds of conducts. The, the reason why the Buddha named the other Buddhas, countless Buddha have named many conducts to, and teach, teach the conduct to their disciples in their time due to him, uh, teach this special, universal, worthy conduct. I have to tell you, otherwise you don't understand. Because this is my own experience, okay? There are conducts that is worthy to be humans, yeah, or to be sane and saints in this physical world, or in the uh, shadow world, yeah? But there are conducts which is above this area, I mean above the physical world, no, not, um, not the shadow world yet. Okay, so the universal, meaning for the universe to accept you as a worthy person, as a worthy saint. There are other conducts. You cannot just practice, okay, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't tell lie, I don't have sexual misconduct, I don't uh, take uh, intoxicant, then you are a worthy person in the whole universe. No, there are other conducts which you cannot do it by physical means. You gain it through meditation practice. As you go higher, you gain more worthiness. There are worthy powers and other, many other powers 
which is not uh, named or not practiced in this world. For example, I go to different uh, realms. Oh no, I cannot count anymore. Every day, 20 something realms that I pass, and I had no time anymore to write down. I've been neglecting my spiritual account for a long, long time now. Not long, maybe at least a few weeks now. After I did the last retreat, things jump up so quickly. Every day, 20, some 29, and sometimes even 30, 31 new spiritual realms. Normally, if it's a few, I always write it. It doesn't matter how late. It doesn't matter how tired I am. I always note down the the realms that I have passed and the reinforced powers that I have got. But these days, I have no chance, no time. So every day, even if I have a time to turn the page of my diary, I would say, today, 29 new realms. And yesterday, maybe 28. And then the next day, 30. Another day, just right on top, that's it. And now and then, if I have more, just a little more time, or even if I care, I write out how much spiritual, uh, merit, countless Ganges, rivers, uh, sands, uh, SMP, spiritual merit point. You see, nowadays, my diary is all blank. Just a few numbers on the right top. I have hope that maybe tomorrow, uh, one or the day after, I will have a chance to write it. But it has been at least 10 days already. It's all empty. It's all the number. 25, it depends on how busy I am. 24, 25, 29 only. And that is not like I've been on retreat even. I just meditate at night whenever I can, or daytime, and it jump up so fast like that. Because one time, uh, they report to me that if I want more, new rims, more power, I have to go to such and such area. Yeah. I said, sorry, I can't. Can you not bring them here for me? And they did. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, now it's overwhelming. I have no time to count and no time to write out the new rims as well as what power they transmitted and uh, returned to me. But it's just, by the way, to tell you some happening in your master late time, huh? late uh, period of time. In one of these powers that, that exist in the universal, you know, above, even above the shadow world, is worth power. Worth power. That the whole universe look upon you as a worthy being. But because I have so many disciples, no matter how much I have, it is still not as much. Still, nevertheless, sometimes I say to them, okay, I'm not worthy, so what? Okay, what do you want to do about it? <laughs> and then in my vision, they say, no, no, you're still worthy. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> because the Maya sometimes cheat me, tell lie, you know. They told me, if you don't eat, then you'll be more worthy. I say, get lost. It's just as <laughs> some uh, physical things. And uh, I know I create my own food anyway, e even though it doesn't look like that. Yeah, the food came from love, power of love, the power of loving creativeness. Yeah, so I don't owe you nothing, get lost. <laughs> but he always tried these and others, you know, be breatharian, you'll be more worthy. I said, no, yeah, worthy for how long? You cut off 28 years of my life. <laughs> how worthy can that be? How good is the worthiness to me if I die earlier? And my, all my disciples became orphans so early, and other people who are supposed to come to me cannot see me. Yeah. Get lost, I keep telling him, get lost. He tries so hard. You know, the Maya tries so hard. <laughs> Try very hard. If he cannot directly influence me or talk to me, then he make uh, you know, the attendance of the dogs. Not my attendant, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a lot of so-called assistant, attendant, sutta, this sutta, that, you know. I have nothing anymore. I'm so scared to, to use anyone because the Maya will use them to bother me, okay? So I clean up myself. I do most of the thing myself, whatever I can. I don't let anybody go near. They just take care of the dogs. Even then, they still make trouble for them and then to trouble the dogs. You know, make the dogs ill, make the dog trouble, and then trouble me. 
or make the assistant hey why and then trouble me too. Even I don't ask them to do anything for me already. Yeah, of course, wash the clothes because some clothes are so delicate. I can't even wash them myself. You know, you need special treatment. Yeah, they just give me all the uniform, <laughs> the working clothes. I have only two monks' clothes. Look like this. Yeah, long one. Only two. Normally in my cave, only two of that for for summer. Okay, and then some of the I already worn before in retreat, the warm clothes. So I save a couple of them, and these couple and some inside uh, clothes to keep you warm, you know, thermos clothes. That's it. That's all I have, and I, I hang them on a, a metal string. But because I have to work, you know, now they come in some other clothes, they bring it in many clothes, and I have to have a plastic wardrobe, you know? <laughs> Traveling one, yeah. I don't want the heavy wood and stuff like that. In case I don't need any more, I can just take it out and throw it outside. And they take it away. Everything in the cave now is all plastic, simple, easy. You know, plastic tent. <laughs> and uh, I cannot bear it. It's too many things. Originally, I have only one tent. And later, they put another tent because the cave, cave was leaking. <laughs> I had to put things inside. Computer and stuff, sensitive stuff. But now they, they patch up the roof upstairs, so I'd say, please, take the tent away. <laughs> too many tent, too many things. Just one thing you don't use, it feels cluster, yeah? I say, but Master, we, we can put it back in the same place. They say, I don't need it. What for? Put it back. <laughs> but I don't want to offend them, so I say, never mind, you fold it. If I need, you can do it right away. So why put it there or now, okay? And some of these uh, plastic uh, wardrobe, you know, you hang, you know, these uh, precious <laughs> modeling stuff inside. Because uh, don't hang in there, sometimes it's too dusty, the wind blow. And now I even have plastic door. You know? <laughs> Nowadays it's so convenient, I'm telling you. They just put a fan, you know, fix a, a frame, put the fans, iron fans in between, and it become the door. And then it's too cold, I plaster, put them plastic, plastic sheet on it. The, the soft one, but thick, yeah, it's transparent, then it becomes like a door. No wind come in anymore. They use it with the wind like highway, you know, ooh, ooh, and it makes noise even, ooh, ooh. <laughs> wow. Free music, yeah, <laughs> free of jobs, yeah. But I did not feel all that cold at that time even. I just put a curtain on one side, then the wind is less. If it has another outlet, there were two big hole entrance, one the front, one the back. That's it, nothing else. And, and I just uh, put some curtain on, you know? And then one side, the wind don't come out, then the other side is less. Then I was okay there, all winter, until they make a, uh, recently make this uh, so-called door, you know? For safety also, you know, the safety, nobody can climb inside, yes. And then we put some clear plastic on and then it's become door. Oh, I was thinking, what a luxury I had, because it's so quick. You understand? If you want to make a door, then you have to measure it correctly, yeah, and make the frame. Uh, in my cave is not possible because the uh, curve in here and there is not like your house have a... Uh, a straight <laughs> square, you know, so they cannot make door anyway, you know, just put some fence, yeah, and then uh, the plastic on is wonderful, and some curtain, you know, for darkness or privacy, and it's, it's very windproof in there, so it's very convenient, I'm telling you. Now I even have to cut the one piece of the plastic down, flap it down to make a window, <laughs> <laughs> so that I have more air inside, just plastic sheet, and it's so windproof already. And for me, I can make a window, magic. I use a, a knife, just cut this, this, like that, and it's a window already. Because they put some mosquito net, the screen door, they put a screen on top, they tied it on the, on the fence. Then you have, you have it, you have everything. The door can also screen, you see? Uh, they have one side screen, one side, one side, they tape it on, so fit. So I feel, so forget it, you know? <laughs> I use my knife to cut my, Instant window. <laughs> oh, not just immediate enlightenment, but immediate window. <laughs> Everything nowadays is instant, immediate. Instant noodle also. 
Oh, I feel our time is really <laughs> very convenient and wonderful. Huh? Imagine the Buddha's time. He doesn't have even a tent. He sit under the Bodhi tree. Hmm? Jesus sat in the desert. Nothing. Many people in the old time, they sit under the tree. Yes, some trees are so thick, or they have a hollow in their trunk. You could sit there. I've seen some, you know, not in our area. <laughs> Unfortunately, otherwise, <laughs> I would be very happy <laughs> to use it. No need to bother anybody. So I, I was thinking, very, very happy, very happy yogi I am. You know, everything so quick, instant, and useful. I mean, it's just the same as a door. Because if you want to make a real door, you have to measure correctly, make a frame correctly. I have to stuff all these uh, curving holes because of the cave, you know, they're not like here. They're not square and symmetrical, no. So the fence is as good as it gets already, fine. And then I even have mosquito net and the instant window. Oh, I feel so happy, you know. I feel like very, very contented, you know, very lucky. And whenever I take a shower, the warm water, oh, in winter, is like heaven. <laughs> huh? Feels so good, so good. Yeah. The Buddha did not have all this. If he want to take a shower, I think somebody has to boil water for him at that time. Perhaps they didn't have master skills. No, not my skill. It's our, our modern time skill. It's not my skill. It's the electrician. He put a, a water tank. <laughs> a heater <laughs> is plugged in, brother, <laughs> and the water just run out, you know, automatically, just like in your bathroom. I don't have a luxury bathroom, but I have run in hot water. That is important, okay? Very important. And next to the cave even. Imagine I don't have to go out far. Hmm? Inside the cave, is it warm enough? It's warm enough, of course, and nowadays you have heater, don't you know that? <laughs> I can afford a couple, yeah? But in winter, I did, not, I did not put any heater in there. During this winter, I did not put, except at night when I go into the tent, it's cold, you know, dewy and, and damp, and I put on, uh, nowadays they even, they even invented the, the fan with the heater together. You can have cool and wheel at the same time. And very small like this, I can put in my tent in the corner, and it even turn around, <laughs> yeah. But I cannot have that all night because it's too hot inside. Because the tent is small, so everything, you know, like build up inside. So I just have it for like, I time it, you know, two hours or something. Sometimes I have to even turn it off before that. It's too hot, too hot. You live in a tent, it's, it's proof already. It's, it's good, my tent. Very good. I'm so happy with that tent. I told you we could give him Nobel Peace Prize for in, invention of the tent, whoever did that. In the, the first one, we invented it. Even the one that you can turn it into the round shape, you know? Yeah, and then when you throw it in the air, it became your house already. You know those uh, instant tent? Oh, what a lifetime, yeah. I didn't have all this convenience in other lifetimes, so that's why I appreciate it so much. <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are. You, took, you take everything for granted. I lived a long time before. We didn't have this. Even when I was a king, for example, I don't have this convenience. I have to rely on eunuchs and concubines and all kind of people. And it's really give you a headache. You know, with their ego, their clumsiness, or their misunderstanding, all kind of thing. Don't think you have a lot of servants you have been. No. That's why many kings are bad mood, you know, <laughs> cannot be too happy. Have you ever seen any picture or any painting of the king laughing like we do here? Like me? <laughs> no. Oh, mm. Mm. <laughs> and even her burn others look even more serious. Because they don't have the tent that I had. <laughs> yeah? If we want to take a bath, we have to tell somebody, bring a bath. He has to wait for half an hour, one hour from another corner of the workers' uh, uh, quarter to bring it to his chamber. And uh, maybe water cold already. So I have many more, bring more in, you know? Yeah. Male dominated as well. Imagine if I was a queen, it's even worse. Yeah. 
All the male have to be around to bring hot water, yeah, and then to take the dirty water out. Oh man, it's it's really <laughs> put you off when you just sweating all over and you want to take off your clothes and want to jump into your bath or in your shower. You have to wait one hour or two for the water to, and even wood <laughs> wood oven, you know. And then man has to carry it and you have to wait there. And, and you're feeling so suffocating and you went outside, you know, there's a little fresh air for them to prepare your bath. And then you don't sweat anymore. And then you don't feel like taking that bath anymore. Our body's already prepared and you don't enjoy as much as when you were sweating and ready for a shower. No wonder all the king and queen look so miserable. Mm. <laughs> Only a few kings and queens are very wise to leave the palace, leave everything, and go become a monk in a cave somewhere. Like Sakamuni Buddha, maybe he's fed up with these bad things and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one motivation, one reason, you know, to, to push you upward. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes some Buddha uh, reincarnates, and maybe he's so forgetful, yeah, about his purpose. Or, or some saying, you know, forget that he's, he's supposed to be practicing, yeah? And some uh, heavenly being would create some trouble so that the Buddha, you know, future Buddha or the supposed to be Buddha, wake up and get out of that situation and do something. So maybe the hot bath is the, you know, the last <laughs> straw, <laughs> the last push for the Buddha to get out of the bath. <laughs> Not to talk about 500 women quarreling day and night with each other for the precious possession, you know, the one and only object of adoration and possession, the king. 500 people quarreling, vying with each other, you know, jealousy with each other every day. And the atmosphere, how you bear it. I really feel those kings in the old days, they are really tough men. Oh. No wonder, very rare, we have queen. Nobody can bear it as a woman. We cannot bear it. We will tell them, get lost. <laughs> you know, we will be yelling all day because we cannot bear it. But the men, you know, the more stressed, the more terror, 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 and then they get stronger and stronger. That's why they can become king long time. And most men are king. Not kings are men, I mean. <laughs> yeah, you are also king. Most men are king of, they behave like one. <laughs> they can't cook. <laughs> the women have to cook for them. Yeah? They can't do this, they can't do that. Yeah. If that's not king, then what? Huh? How can you not cook? Why not? So easy. Put all the vegetables, chop, chop. <laughs> Wash it, throw it in the, in the big uh, wok or whatever, stir it up, put a little bit of salt inside, or maybe some condiment and take it out and eat it. How, how difficult can that be? <laughs> Cannot you cook? Go home, learn, okay, from your wife. Or learn from some disciple and surprise your wife, surprise your girlfriend sometime. Give her a break. Huh? Give her a break from the kitchen. Go home, train your husbands, train your sons, train your boyfriends, okay? Make them cook. You don't want to? Okay, today no dinner. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> and if they don't want to, okay, go earn your money, buy your pizza. <laughs> dig it? Yeah. You dig, good. <laughs> I learned that from movies. <laughs> Some American, they say, dig? You dig it? Dig. <laughs> I mean, did you capish? You know, you understand it. But you don't need to translate it. When I ask you, did you dig? You dig it, then you understand. <laughs> right, continue. Now we go back to serious business. <laughs> the universal uh, worthy Bodhisattva arose from his seat and tell that he practiced uh, this conduct. So he said that the Buddha asked about 
perfect penetration. The basic course I speak of in my case is listening with the mind to discover and distinguish at ease. This is the foremost method. Uh, you've seen some intellect. Yeah? You have to listen with concentration yeah, and distinguish what is what. Meaning, what the meaning? The Buddha say that. Why he say that? There's some deeper meaning behind. Really must concentrate and analyze it. Using that, you must listen with the mind and uh, distinguish at ease. Yeah, this is the foremost method. That's just for him. But above that, he also have the universal worthy power. Because of that, for aeons of times, he has always been able to. Uh, appear different places to help the people who also practice universal worthy conduct. Universal worthy conduct is one of the method, yeah, from 84,000 method. Some people practice that, yeah, just to be really good, pure, morally fit, and are meditating, you know, on the universal power. Only if you can. Only if you happen to tap into that corner of the universe where it houses universal power. Just like I went to different new realms and where it happened to store universal power there. Like, for example, I go to a place named A, okay? And that new spiritual realm houses two powers. They also have other inherent powers, but one of it is. Worthy power, okay? Worth, they call it worth power, not worthy power. But this worth is even above this kind of universal worthy power. In order to go higher into new realms all the time, I need many different powers to go up, yeah, to go up. And nowadays, I, there's more than I could even count now. I have no time to even write out what realms I pass and what power I have reclaimed. But it's still reclaimed nevertheless. It's just that I did not record it, that's all. I just hope one day I have a long, long, long winter hibernation, then I can remember and write it all down. Or maybe not. So, because of that even, he could go and help a lot of people. You see, so the saints and sages, they don't just uh, practice, attain their enlightenment, and sit there doing nothing. They're quite busy, yeah? Going from one place to another, helping one person after another, even though they don't even know it. Yeah. Just like you have angels around you protecting you every day, but you don't see them. <laughs> All right. So now we go to the next one. Huh? My calendar is running wide. Oh, the really and tall. How I say so many years together. <laughs> okay, now. Sudarananda is another monk. Arose from his seat, bow at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha. When I first left home and followed the Buddha to enter the way, meaning for enlightenment, yeah, the way. They call it the way, the path, the Tao, is the same. I received the complete precepts, 250 precepts, yeah, for monks and nuns. But my mind was always too scattered for samadhi. Even received the precepts and some, maybe some meditation instruction, but his mind is running all over the place cannot concentrate, so he cannot enter samadhi state. And I could not attain the state of having no outflows. Of course, if you don't meditate well, all your defects will not be cleansed for this lifetime. And that's very difficult to enter samadhi or to progress. Yes. The word honor one, meaning the Shakyamuni Buddha, taught cows Tila and me to contemplate the white spot at the tip of our noses. Do we have one? Oh yeah, if you if you if you look down like this, there's something. <laughs> okay. I think that is the most easy one for this monk to practice. Okay? Just like Patanjali, he teaches his disciples 
a different method. Yes. Uh, do you want different methods from me? No, we don't. No, no you don't? You happy with this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because we have many, okay? Uh, by the way, before you meditate, okay, you should take some deep breath. You lay down. Yeah? It's better laying down because it's very relaxing. If you sit down, maybe you might fall down afterward. You just lay down and you breathe in as deep as you can, with the nose, okay? And now uh, you say, lead it all the way to your stomach or your solar plexus, yeah? And then go back all the way to the chest and then all the way to your head yeah? and to the crown, or to inside the head, doesn't matter. And hold it ten, count to ten, and exhale. Yeah? Maybe six times. And then you meditate. You will find more calm, okay? More easy to, to sit. All right. Does that apply to both sound and like meditation? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Before the light or before the sound meditation. It's okay. If you find yourself not very restful, then you do that. Or you can do that anytime. It helps, okay? Before you meditate. And if you find yourself also a little bit angry or vexed because of situation or because of somebody uh, kind of uh, rub off on you, people rub off on you all the time. Even you recite the five names, sometimes you forget. Eh? So you take deep breath like that. And then you just sit down somewhere, okay? Safe, and do that. Okay? Mm-hmm. Just make sure you don't fall down. Eh? <laughs> because for me, sometimes I just... Take a deep breath in and I'm gone already. <laughs> Too tired. <laughs> Too tired. <laughs> Too tired, you know? Sometimes because of working too hard or because of somebody, it depends on the situation. I came home, you know, enter my tent, and I want to turn on the, the warm heater, yeah? I just turn it on and then I'm gone. <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then I'm still holding it. <laughs> and only when it dropped, you know, boom, then I, I realized, ah, <laughs> why am I gone so quickly? So therefore, that's why most masters teach you to sit on the floor, huh? Because if you're standing up and meditate like that, you don't only drop the remote control, you drop your whole body and you might be in trouble, yeah? And don't try to test your own uh, spiritual stamina by sitting on the edge of the stone, you know, with a cliff underneath. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> or if you want to go back home earlier, maybe you can. <laughs> there was a story, a Zen story, about one monk. He always wanted to test his uh, samadhi power. Sure enough, you know, sometimes ego makes you do crazy things. Don't do any crazy thing. Just do normal thing, okay? I teach you what you do what, yeah? Slowly, yeah? And even if you're already Buddha, don't sit on the edge of the cliff. Yeah? You dig? Yes. Dig, good. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> the man, he sit on top of a stone. You know? All around is cliff. Sometimes the stone, they st- st- stuck out in the air, you know? He sit right there. And then he falling, and the uh, hufa, you know, the Dharma God come and caught him, and he's safe. Oh, he not even thank the God. He said, "How many practitioner in the world could be as excellent as I am?" <laughs> yeah, because the Dharma God help him. We feel he's some big shot. You know, sit on there, making trouble for the Dharma God, don't even say sorry, don't even say thank you. How many excellent practitioners <laughs> like me in this world? So the Dharma God answer, you know the answer, right? I told this joke before. He says, such a lousy like you, oh, plenty, plenty. <laughs> a lousy one like you, oh, plenty, plenty. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Just don't do it, okay? Even you, if you have angel around you. <laughs> All right, you laugh enough already? Good.
laughter is good for you. You see, we encompass also another yoga practice. Yeah, laughing yoga, no? <laughs> yeah, for that I should cash in some extra. <sighs> I promise you, I teach you Kuan Yin method free of charge, but I didn't say the laughing <laughs> method. <laughs> what? Bonus. Yeah, bonus, bonus, I didn't say bonus. <laughs> and breathing also? Oh, that's the third one. Gosh. This woman doesn't know how to do business. <laughs> I can only design clothes or jewelry, but I don't do business. It's them who fix the prices or who pay the taxes and who do all the accounting stuff. Yeah, if I do business, I probably lose all the time. Like to give, you know. Oh, you like it, but you don't have money? Here, <laughs> take it. <laughs> yeah, I probably give more than I can even have time to design or, or the, the jewelry, or even have time to make, you understand? So I just stay out of my inexperienced trade, you know? I just sit here, do what I can, you know? Reading is easy, right? <laughs> Making calendar is not too, not too difficult. <laughs> Explaining things, you know? You don't understand anyway, so whatever I say... <laughs> whatever I say is okay, yeah. <laughs> you just like to look at me only, you told me. Whenever you look at me, you don't feel hungry, you don't feel cold, don't feel thirsty, you don't want to go home. So I just sit here and talk whatever, yeah, mm, to make you happy. <laughs> because whatever I say, you know, some of you, you're always happy, yeah, and laugh, and, and some even very much agree to it. <laughs> always, yeah. Yeah, whatever I say. <laughs> yeah. There's the Taiwanese and Vietnamese side, eh? And some do the Indian side. <laughs> yeah? This means yes, no? You know, right? <laughs> wow, good disciples indeed. Always agree with the Master. Yeah, not only laughing, clapping, but obviously <laughs> nodding as well, you know, to make it more emphasized. And even make, make some sound to... <laughs> more <laughs> to be more obvious, you know? Telling you, <laughs> you if the Buddha is here, I think he will shake his head. <laughs> I think he won Nirvana quicker. <laughs> his disciples, all our hearts already since since Ganges sends rivers lifetime, and my disciple, I don't know where you're from. <laughs> Just know how to laugh, eat, agree. <laughs> And make some, <laughs> make some approval sound. <laughs> I'm telling you, lucky I'm not Japanese, Roshi. I beat you, you know. <laughs> if you don't sit straight and nothing like that, no matter you agree or disagree, they will beat you up. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Lucky you, I'm not Japanese Roshi. <laughs> I mean master. Yeah, Roshi means master in Japan. You're lucky so many ways. I don't charge you the extra method. <laughs> Free of charge, laughter, all kind of things. Good food, yeah. Mm. Good to greenhouse for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is very convenient, hey? Yeah. Very welcome. It's good, it's good. I mean, better than nothing. <laughs> Oh, man, are you such happy kids? <laughs> so happy, happy people. i never seen so happy people, so many happy people in any of the temples assembly in my life. I've been to quite a few temples and ashram, and I never see any crazily laughing like you are <laughs> all the time. Anything I say, you laugh, no matter what. If you understand, you laugh. You don't understand, also you laugh. <laughs> 
<laughs> because the neighbor laugh, you must laugh. <laughs> Otherwise, they know you are dumb dumb. You didn't understand master joke or, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. You feel better today? Yeah. Yeah. You catch up with your jet lag already? I feel sorry for you. Yeah. Today, I feel happy for you. Mm. <laughs> because you don't agree, obviously. <laughs> you don't use this method to agree anymore. I know you catch up. <laughs> Yeah, okay, it's fine. Just to see each other is also good, yeah? Now and then. Who cares what I said, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so the Buddha taught him Sudarananda to contemplate on the tip of your nose. From the first, he continued, yeah, this monk. From the first, I contemplated intently. After three weeks, I saw that the breath in my nostrils looked like smoke when I inhale and exhale. My body and mind became bright inside, and I perfectly understood the external world to the point that everything became empty and pure, like crystal. The smoky appearance gradually disappeared and the breath in my nostrils became white. When he said that, I don't know, maybe he, he meditated in a cold winter area and when you breathe out, it's <laughs> white, no? You think so? No. Huh? Like a chimney. Is <laughs> okay, now, yeah, it's just because his mind is different, not because the smoke come out of his nostril is different. His mind is different. Yeah. He probably go up to a li different level, and it became like that. Because you can see here, he said, my body and mind became bright inside, and I perfectly understood the external world to the point that everything became empty and pure, like crystal. And the smoky appearance gradually disappeared, and the breath in my nostrils became white. Okay, not smoky, but white. <laughs> it's just when you are in different level, you see things differently. Just like I see the green ugly sofa became white, you know, reclining. Uh, they call it a lounge chair, you know? Yeah, long, white. Or oh, that I didn't see the other three bottles next to the one bottle that I saw. Yeah. Something like that. Many other things I don't remember now to tell you, okay? When we are in a different level of consciousness, we see more reality than the appearance of this illusionary uh, magic game here, okay? Yeah. It's nothing really mysterious. Nowadays, even scientists can prove it. You know, the hologram things, I told you already, right? Who is that singer? They created a hologram of her in another far, far, farther away concept, different concept. So see, be in two places at the same time with the hologram technique. Yeah, that's a technique, you can do it already nowadays. It's just very expensive for your master to, <laughs> to try. Maybe later you see me here, but not me here, huh? <laughs> yeah. Beloved master, even uh, quantum physics proved that everything is made of music. Music, yes, uh, sound. Music, sound, sound. oh yeah, yeah vibration, yeah. okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, they, they prove everything nowadays. There's nothing mysterious anymore, okay, huh? Yeah, soon. You can also appear in many places just to scare people. <laughs> when they were gossiping about you and you just appear. <laughs> I heard everything. I will change my will. <laughs> you know, the, the will of the inheritance. <laughs> in France, uh -huh. uh, during last election, one politician made uh, some uh, speech uh -huh. And he was at another place, uh -huh. making the sa same speech with other people. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays we can do that. Yeah, in France they make it already. Yeah, yeah. You see that? I'm not telling the story. It's true. I saw uh, the clip just passing by somewhere. I don't know where. I saw her just standing there singing, talking to her fans. Uh, but she has having a physical concert. 
long distance from there. You know, I don't know how many miles or how many countries. Yeah, it's nowadays they can make that already. Okay, maybe one day then it's good. I can retire. You know, I sit in my cave and just project this. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe each of you will have one master <laughs> in a hologram. <laughs> what? Where? <laughs> master, please touch my head. <laughs> Can I hug you? <laughs> yeah, something like that. And you're hugging nothing. Yeah? yeah, but I wonder why it took so long, because in the movie Star Wars, you know, they already saw this type of thing already, yeah? Why does it take so long now to realize this, to make it come true? In the future, this hologram stuff will be cheaper. Yeah. And I can just sit in my cave all day long. <laughs> Whenever I want to talk to you, I just project this hologram. I just tell the assistant, now, turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> tell everybody to, to gather first, you know, and then now, turn it on, and then you saw me sitting here. Yeah, just like now. Who knows, yeah? Nowadays, we're so advanced, uh, not as good as in many other dimensions, even in the astral level, we are nowhere yet. But still better than hundred or thousand years before, right? Yes. Okay. Coming back to serious Buddha business. So, my mind, Sudarananda, continue, yeah? Because at that time, he must be in Samadhi or in some different level, because he say his body and mind very bright. He see the light inside and he, he thinks it's from his body and mind. But he enter another dimension, you know, or maybe inside, you see, Samadhi. That's why he say his mind and body very bright. Just when, like, when you meditate, you see the light, that's what it is, and you think it's from here or from your own body. Mm. So that's how he described it at that time. Mm. And then he said, my mind opened and my outflows were extinguished. Every inhalation, inhalation and exhalation of breath was transformed into light, which illumined the ten directions, and I attained a hardship. The world honor one predicted that in the future I would obtain Bodhi, I mean, would become Buddha. Well, it doesn't need Buddha to say that. I can also say that. <laughs> Everybody in the future will be a Buddha. <laughs> The Buddha asked about perfect penetration. I did it by means of the disappearance of the breath, until eventually the breath emitted light, and the light completely extinguished my outflows. This is the foremost method. So that's what he thinks, yeah? That because he observed the breath, and the breath transformed itself into light, and the, that light purify him, etc., etc. Yeah, and then the Buddha even say that he will realize Buddhahood. So he's happy and he thinks uh, practicing on the breath is the very best method. The next one. Purnamatreya Yaniputta arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha, For vast kalpas, again, oh, I have possessed unobstructed eloquence, when I discuss suffering, oh, oh, this monk also knew his past numerous kalpas. I have possessed unobstructed eloquence. When I discuss suffering and emptiness, I penetrate deeply into the actual appearance, and in the same way, I give subtle, wonderful instruction to the assembly concerning the secret Dharma doors of as many first come ones as there are sands in the Ganges. I have also obtained fearlessness. The world honor one, Sekamuni Buddha, knew that I had great eloquence, and so he made use of my voice in turning the wheel of the Dharma. He taught me how to disseminate it. I joined the Buddha to help him turn the wheel. I explained it. I accomplished a hardship through the lion's roar. The world honor one certified me as being foremost in speaking Dharma. The Buddha asked about perfect penetration. I used the sound of Dharma to subdue demons and adversaries 
and melt away my outflows. This is the foremost method. This monk, he always had, you know, perfect eloquence, great eloquence. And this, in this lifetime, also the Buddha asked him maybe to help go out and make some lecture in the place of the Buddha, or maybe helping him while the Buddha was preaching, he also do some preaching. And he thinks, because of preaching the Dharma, that he has extinguished his, his outflows, yeah? his defects. So he thinks that is the method, because he used that sound of the preaching, of the truth. When he preached the truth, he can subdue the demons and all that, and extinguish his own defects. So he thought that is the best method. Yeah? So that's his method, yeah? When you preach in the Dharma and you enter Samadhi, you clean yourself, purify yourself. And so he thinks his eloquence, you know, his preaching of the truth has helped him. Uh, next one. When you preach your Master Dharma outside, do you have any of this kind of experience? See in the past? Ganges send cowboys? No? Yes? No? No. Okay. It's good that you're honest. <laughs> this period of our life, of our time, you know, it's very difficult for people to attain such attainments. But these are hard. They have been countless of aeons already, been saints. So they came back to help the Buddha in some way. You know, either to help him to preach the Dharma instead of him all the time, just like some warning messenger go out, or you do it, you know, or uh, some other help him, like being his attendant, yeah. Other help him in uh, uh, giving the precepts to the new monks. Other helps him in maybe, you know, cleaning the <laughs> the ashram, because uh, if you are not pure, and you should not go there even even just to clean the ashram. Nowadays, I don't know, just whoever can clean, just clean. But not clean my personal space, just a street or something around. And even then, I let them in only once a month. I don't want people to come in and out every day. I'd rather have the dry leaves <laughs> there on the street. They're harmless, okay? They don't emit any bad energy or whatever, <laughs> or disturbance, or they don't want me to go out and uh, touch their head or bless them or whatever, yeah. So cleanliness has many forms, eh? It's not like you bath and then you shower, you shampoo and then you perfume and then, and then you're clean, not necessary. Huh? Clean inside is very important. But outside also must clean, eh? please don't <laughs> emit, don't emit something that is, <laughs> that's not supposed to you emit. Now, there's another monk, okay? Yupali arose from his seat. I think they take turn one by one. Whoever came first to the Buddha to learn, they, they spoke first. Yeah, they have this kind of order. So otherwise, everybody stand up at the same time <laughs> and speak together, then the Buddha can never hear, or the assembly cannot hear anything. Yeah. So now it's Yupali. Yupali arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, I followed the Buddha in person when he fled the city and left the home life. I observed the thirst come one endure six years of diligent ascetism. I watched the thirst come one subdue all the demons, control adherents of external paths, and become liberated from all outflows, which were based on worldly desire and greed. Wow, this one followed Buddha a long time, huh? Probably one of his uh, attendants before or something, yes. Or maybe just one of the first ones who caught sight of him and then followed him to help him in some way. Six, six years. Six, yeah, during six years even. I based myself on the Buddha's teaching of precepts, encompassing the three thousand awesome departments and the 80,000 subtle aspects. Both my direct karma and my contributing karma became pure. My body and mind became tranquil, and I accomplished a hardship. In the Thirst Come One's assembly, 
I am a governor of the law. The Buddha himself certified my mind upholding the precepts and my genuine cultivation of them. I am considered a leader of the assembly. The Buddha asked about perfect penetration. I discipline the body until the body attain ease and comfort. Then I discipline the mind until the mind attain penetrating clarity. After that, the body and mind experience keen and through absorption. This is the foremost method. So, for him, the precepts is the foremost method. You know, you discipline your mind and your body. Don't let them rule over you. Because the body sometimes desires something which is obstructive to your spiritual progress. Yeah? The mind sometimes gives you nonsensical ideas yeah, and make you run around, you know, for the object of your desire, so called the mind desire. And he disciplined them all mm. through the precepts of the Buddha. So for him, he thinks that is a method. Controlling the mind and the body. Okay, what is direct karma and contributing karma that he can purify? Anybody know? I don't have anything. <laughs> Maybe a pen. Okay, South African, tell me. Most of the direct karma is the karma that's directly linked to him, and the associated karma is the karma around him that he collects or that he works with. What is the direct karma again? His direct karma, uh -huh. the, the karma that he deals with directly himself, in himself. You mean for this lifetime? Yes. Uh -huh. And then the and other the one? the associated is for what he collects around him. Mm, okay, good. Meaning nothing can affect him anymore. Mm -hmm. Even this lifetime karma he can control. Like yesterday I have told you, suppose you were born to do something bad, Mm -hmm. But because of the precepts, you know what is right, what is wrong. You don't do it. At least the action, you don't do it. Even though you have the urge inside or the, the thinking, but you control. Okay? And then you also control your mind that it don't even think like that. You cut it off right away. When something not correct arises in your mind, you cut it off. You don't follow it. Yeah? You control it. And then, of course, you control the body also. Mm -hmm. And the contributing karma... It's people affecting you around you, correct? Yeah, yes, I have a pen to sign, to sign your, your real estate deal. <laughs> Is business better now? Yes, master. <laughs> yeah, good. Yes, yes, okay. I'm happy for you. How about the last boyfriend? Does he last? No, there's no boyfriend, master, and I'm happy so now. So he didn't last either? No. Okay. I... I reckon, I thought so. I thought he won't last either. Even though you told me that he was the best, he could help you a lot of things, but I think he won't last. Okay. Well, I'm glad I last. <laughs> At least one person lasts in your life. <laughs> Master, you my true love. <laughs> you are my true love. <laughs> oh, wow. Huh? You are the true love for all of us. How touchy feely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, the contributing karma. This is a karma that people. Yeah, collective karma. And yeah, people around you, they make trouble for you. Okay? Of course, you can do that if you don't teach anybody. If you're alone, practicing all for yourself and maybe indirectly. Uh, automatically, by the way, influence your five, six, seven generation. But if you are a master, oh, any karma is allowed <laughs> to be near you, to cling on you, to rub off on you, hmm? no matter if you're Buddha or not. See, that's why the Buddha, because of his disciple, he has no food for three months. He has to eat uh, horse food. And Jesus has to be nailed on the cross because of karma of disciples, and endless other masters, you name them, they all have them, okay? But for the disciples, it's no problem, no big deal. You don't have anything. <laughs> you may be affected, you know, it can be affected 
for just temporarily, but hardly anything too serious. That's a job. You want a job? <laughs> no. Wise, wise. Mm. You see, this man, he's uh, probably, uh, later on, uh, the world called him precept number one, you know? Mm. Just like Ananda is memory number one, and Wunsu, uh, Manjushri is uh, wisdom number one, for example, like that. And Maura Lagayana is uh, magical number one, etc. Yeah? This one, precept withholding number one. That's why he became like a precept transmitter in this group. Uh, whoever knew a Kama, he probably transmit the precept. So he's a law holder in this assembly. Yeah. So that's what he thinks, yeah? Precepts, yeah, and controlling your mind, your body. Don't let it ruin you. Don't let it rule over you is a method, right? Now, Maugayayana arose from his seat, bowed at the feet of the Buddha and said to the Buddha, once when I was out on the road begging for food, I met the three Kashyapa brothers. Three of them. One name is Yuruviva, another one named Gaya, the other one named Nadi, who proclaimed for me the thirst come one's profound principle of causes and conditions. I immediately brought forth resolve and obtained the great understanding. Just to hear the cause and effect, uh, he determined to obtain a great understanding, meaning he resolved he must get enlightenment. Yeah, he resolved at that time. Because sometime maybe he became a monk under the Buddha, but he has not completely determined in his mind to get enlightenment. You know, it's just too comfortable <laughs> every day sit at the Buddha's feet, listening to him talking and explaining things, and the Buddha pamper, you know, spoiling all his monks like his own children. Yeah, it's too comfortable. You know, you know something, and you feel something, and you're determined to get it. It's another thing. So he know, okay, everybody should get enlightenment, just like all of you do. Yes, Master, we want enlightenment, but I don't know how much you want. So only that day when he went out baking, and suddenly he listened to these three brothers, same in the house, same uh, Buddha's monk, talking about cause and effect. Karma. Karmas, yeah. And suddenly at that time, maybe he feels scared. Suddenly it hit him that if he doesn't practice well, if he doesn't get complete enlightenment, maybe like that. Every day he took things for granted. Yeah, I have a Buddha. Buddha will save me. Just don't even think like that. Just too comfortable. Just sit there. Doing not much, you know? Maybe you don't meditate very well the way you do. You meditate better, right? <laughs> How did he learn so fast after he went outside and started? It just happened, okay? Just like sometimes, suddenly, you listen to me for years, you know, on the computer, yeah, or internet. Uh, master, uh, yeah, the Buddha, enlightenment nature. <laughs> We all have to be disciplined, must get enlightened. <laughs> you listen and then, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but you don't get it. And suddenly one day you hear one of my sentences, and then, ah, oh, it hit you. It brings you something that you never know before. Or maybe one of your brother and sister, they just talk together about something, and at that moment, somehow, it drives home something, okay? It just happened, yeah. We need a lot of cause and conditions to arrive at where we want to arrive, hmm? okay? So it's just like uh, many, uh, some monks before, he listened to this and then he listened to that, or suddenly he saw this and then he awakened. Not because of the bathtub, <laughs> not because of the bathhouse, not because of the water. It's just the condition ripened, yeah, and then it happened. Just like your mother keep giving you milk, and then suddenly one day, that's it, you don't need more milk. And I have practicing to ride bicycle when I was young. It keep falling, hurting my knees. And one day I just can. I thought I could not. You know, I keep falling and the bicycle run away from you, you know? They control you, not you control the bicycle. It doesn't go straight, it goes to anywhere. 
<laughs> you know that when you first try the bicycle. Till one day I just can, just like that. You see? Yeah. Time, you know? Yeah. Just time, just the right time. Yes. And probably these three brothers talk to each other about the bad consequences of bad action. Yeah? Like you could go to hell forever or suffering forever. Just like uh, one of the sutra, Maugalayanyana. One day he also had to take one of his disciples to go to see hell, see all kind of suffering, to wake him up. See that? Mm. Now these three brothers were talking probably about something very terrible that happened in hell. Maybe because they themselves saw it. That's why it makes more impressive influence on uh, Maugaliyana. Understand? It's, the Buddha say, okay, if you don't practice, you eat meat, you drink wine, you go to hell. And everybody knows that already, yeah? It didn't hit him until that day. Personal experience from these three brothers tell me, oh, you know, my God, yesterday I went to hell. Not went to hell maybe, but hell was open for me to see the scene that people suffer in there, all the beings suffer in there. It's incredible, incredible. It's unbearable. And then it hit him that it's true, it really has hell. And people, beings truly suffering in there. It turned him point in his life. Yeah, it hit him. So he became determined to pursue Buddhahood, at least enlightenment. Otherwise, he don't want to go to hell like that. Yeah. The thirst come one accepted me, and the kasaya was on my body, and my hair fell out by itself. Ah, after that, he came to the Buddha to want to become a monk then. Maybe he was just a lay person before, and just come and go, you know, I don't care. What for become a monk? You know, a monk eat one meal a day, how can I bear it? <laughs> I stay at home, I still have this and that, I eat good food and still can get enlightenment. You see, the Buddha did not say that all of us have to be monks in order to have enlightenment and to reach a Buddha, so why bother, you know? <laughs> Only then it hit him and he ran to the Buddha, became monk. And the kasaya means the, the big rope, the, the most outer rope of the monk. It's like a blanket. Before, you just wrap on your shoulder. Nowadays, they make a button or something here so that it don't fall off. Mm. It's just a blanket that mostly Hindu monks still use in it. You know, they have a blanket, they carry it on their shoulder, so it's convenient, you know? And then monks, they have it. They carry it everywhere. They can spread it on the floor to sleep. They can cover themselves, or they can cover when they take a bath in the Ganges, or they... Don't be too indecently exposed, you know, or change the clothes, something like that. Finally, until this day, in some country it becomes like a must-have, but it doesn't have that uh, practical function anymore. Because in India at that time, you have only one inner garment, maybe another cloth or inner garment, and then outside you have this. And you cover yourself from the shoulder on down all the way to your feet né? when you walk. It's for distance. And also when it's too hard, you cover shorter. You know, for men it's easy. The Hindu monk, they have that, okay? They have only a, maybe a short or a long cloth underneath, and they have a kasha. Some have more, maybe a T-shirt on top, a saffron color or pink color, yeah. Or maybe not, just that this wrap around and they use it for many things, yeah, to even filter their water. They use a corner of it, put water into their gurk or something, or their bowl to filter. Hmm? In old time they do that because they don't have other means. Especially if you are a wandering monk, how can you carry all kind of filter bottle, filter machine with you, no? Or here you have all filter water clean, yeah? Yeah, very good. So that's called a kashya, yeah? And nowadays they make it more official and all. Uh, in the old time, the kashya will wear out sometimes, and the monks, of course, will mend it with their uh, little pad of cloth. And the more patches, you know, meaning the older, more senior in the monkhood, yeah? 
And nowadays they all seal it all up for you already. <laughs> many, many pieces on your kasha. Just symbolic, you know, mean that you mature in monkhood, that you are bichu and bichuni. Yeah. But in the old time, there was a very practical piece of clothing for the monks and for the nuns. Yeah. The nuns, of course, has to wear more. The monk is easy. Even just that is enough. <laughs> and they wash it and they wear it immediately. Mostly they will have only that. They don't have double to change. I had almost like that when I was in Rishikesh, except it's a white. I had two pairs. Because if a woman, you get wet, it clings to your body. It's not good. So if it's wet, I change. So I have two pairs, but very thin, so that I can carry around, okay? And some undergarment, of course, no? All right. So I had only two. Mm. I wash and I wear immediately. Just put on the rock and and you wrap around with something, and then you wait, you meditate, and then your clothes dry, and then, and then you go home. Ah, oh, I feel very nostalgic. As long as I'm along the Ganges River, I do this thing. Yeah. I can't remember so many places I went. Yeah. That kind of life is my life. That really is my life. I was so happy. Uh, I did not even think that I'm happy or not happy. You just feel, you know, empty of everything. You just find, you just live your life. That's the life that I want. And I always love that kind of life. That's the happiest time of my life. That reminds of the poem, On a River Bank. <laughs> yeah, I also said On the River Bank. And that's where the poem came from, eh? the song came from. Also another one I made for the Buddha birthday, also on the Ganges River. Yeah. These poems are real, eh? real scenery. Yeah. Uh, oh, I really love to have that kind of life. You have no idea. You have no idea. You have no idea how I love that kind of life. The other day I was talking to a sister from India and we were saying if we could organize a retreat in, back in Rishikesh or something. You mean me? Are you? Probably we could have worked. All of you? Yeah. I don't know if they have such a big place for you in Rishikesh. It's kind of mountainous, yeah, and some ashram are very small. There's a lot of temples. That I... Temple, but you not know for all this. Small temples, yes. Yeah. And they let you stay three days only. Every resting place in between a temple, three days you can stay. Because other can come. Otherwise, you keep staying there and you become owner of the temple. And no other pilgrim has no place, you see? So the rule, three days, yes, maximum. Mm-hmm. That's very hospitable already, yeah? But I love this kind of life. I don't remember any time, even during my marriage, good marriage, would I have been so happy as that time in Rishikesh. Rishikesh is a more deep impress because I stayed there long and alone in little mud hut, you know? and truly live the life that I wanted to, even though I don't have a lot of money. Every day I can afford to make my own chapati, a few, and then a cucumber or peanut butter. That's it. If I eat a, a, an extra samosa, the next day I have to, <laughs> to skip lunch. Yeah, it's, it's cheap, but I didn't have a lot of money at that time. It had to last, you know, I didn't know how long I stayed. Now I think about it. That's the happiest time ever, you know, of my life. Happiest time. And if I could do it again now, I would be ever so happy again. I imagine that. That is for sure. I know what I want. But we don't always have what we want in life, you know. Life takes us different paths. We just accept it. That brings me to another Topic. The brother asked me, oh, just one more ten, and this one is bigger for you, Master, more comfortable, bigger, larger. I said, no, I have one already, and I'm happy in it. Why have another? He said, well, just one more in case. I said, no, one more is too many already, because now I already have a lot of things. When I first came to the cave, I'm happy, happy. I have only a few pair of clothes hanging on the string. At the window, you know, I don't even have where to hang. I tie the knot between one door and one window to make it like a triangle, empty spot, so I can hang a few pair of clothes. Yeah, and I intended to live like that. And because I forgot that I need to go out and appear in the public and then 
you know, conference, this and that. And then so they bring clothes in and then because a cave would leak in, uh, originally I put clothes somewhere else, so I don't want to put it in my cave. I want my cave just empty like that, as is. I don't even want one more chair inside, just sit on that step so that I can use it also to climb high if I need. But then they brought in a big television. Fine, okay, it's good for me to check out sometime SMTV. And then later, uh, because of my dogs, I have to move my dogs to where my, I put the clothes before. I used to live in the VIP house and one room and put all the clothes in there. That was temporarily during the first retreat. I don't want to stay there. I didn't want to. Any houses, <laughs> don't want to. And have garden and lock gate and everything. Yeah. So then I moved to the other empty house. But then the dogs came and they want to see me. And I don't want to go to the VIP house to see the dogs. The dogs stay in the VIP house. I stay in the cave. So I have to move the dogs there so that I can see them often to see if they're okay or not okay, if they're well taken care of or not. You know, you can see that if you see them often, yeah. And every day I go there and make it into my office, yeah. But that only when I see the dogs. And when I don't see the dogs, then I bring uh, work back to the cave and work there. Also there's electricity, light, yeah, they put it in before I don't have if I don't have to work, I don't need electricity either. Uh, when I first came, I did not even have this heater fan. Nothing. And okay for winter too. If you zip the tent down, then you don't feel that cold. Just a little bit more, more clothes or more blanket. Yeah. They brought me three, three very thin fleece kind of blanket. Sleeping bag actually tight, but I zip it all out and make it. I pin them together, three <laughs> into one blanket. I didn't want to bother take another blanket in anything. I use them all like that, and it was okay. It's a little chilly, but it wasn't all bad. You know, when you're tired, you come home, you just drop that. <laughs> Meditate and then drop that. You don't feel too much discomfort. And then slowly, because of work, and then I have to move all the clothes back to the cave. And now I have even these uh, plastic... Uh, Closet, yeah, but plastic, thank God, you know. But that's it, that's what I have now, yeah, nothing more because of the clothes, you know, to protect these uh, delicate clothes like vegan fur and stuff like that. So he wants to squeeze that tent also inside there. I said, no, 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 please don't make me sacrifice more than I already do. I said that the clothes and the Closet now that we brought newly in is already <laughs> my limit of sacrifice for all this, okay, for my cave. No more, no more, please. Take <laughs> he did not understand, so I had to tell him that. These clothes and closet already a sacrifice for me. So if you put another tent here now, it's a bigger sacrifice. Don't force it. I don't want it. If I can, I would throw everything out in just a few pair of clothes. That's all, then I'm happy. But I cannot, so I have to accept it. So just don't make any more. He, he didn't mean anything bad. He, he worried about me. He was crying even. You know, Master, why stay in such a small space like that? I say, small? I am small. That's enough. You know, the coffin is even smaller. The coffin, you know, when, when we die, even smaller and we fit all in. <laughs> why worry about now? You know, the, the tent is okay. Just fine, yeah. Because the bigger tent, you don't have this kind of throwing in the air and then it becomes a tent, you know? Only smaller one, and you can do that. And I like that. Because I don't know how to string this uh, structure like you do. You, you're more expert. You do that all the time. I cannot. I string one and the other one loose. You know, those uh, Mongolian tent uh, with the sticks and you string them together? I could never do it. It takes me a whole day and... Uh, I fix one, the other one come out. <laughs> they call it a 10-minute assembly kind of tent, but it takes forever. Yeah, they have a stick like this, you know, many sticks, and then you string them together. I don't know, this is, I saw some of your brother and sister do it, and I, I learned, I can, but I stick one in, the other one came down, and forever, so I oh, forget it. I like those that, you know, you just throw it in the air, and it spring up, you know, 30-second tent. Oh, so that's why it's smaller. 
bigger tent, you have to string this thing. <laughs> yeah, and then it keep losing all the time. Or maybe I kick it and then it get loose. I did it all right, but then I'm clumsy. I turn around and then another one loose. And then I fix it. And <laughs> I probably fell down something and it, so many other, they all crumble and lose together. I said, oh, forget it. I don't want ever this tent again. <laughs> we use that tent for outdoor med- meditation as well. Others string out. Oh, that's the best. 30 seconds. That's the best. That's the best. Just string it out. <laughs> no work, you know. I like things that are simple and no work. Yeah, I like things that are simple. I don't even like furniture in my house. So that's as far as I can bear already, you know. These are cupboards for hanging clothes. Another tent. Oh, my God. And this, this big tent, even, with this stringing stuff. <laughs> I, I will sure have fun with it for many days, even if I succeed. It probably take me three days. I probably have to tape it. Like you string it and then you use a <laughs> cellar tape to tape it to make sure it don't come out. I probably have to resource to that. So I say, oh, no, 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 please take it out. <laughs> it take up space, you know. It feels so clustered, yeah? I don't, don't feel comfortable. And a cave even. And it's a very bright orange yellow tent. Oh. <laughs> Not that I could even overlook it, you know? And the cave it looked big, but it's big column and all that inside. They used to put uh, statues of Bodhidharma and the sixth patriot of Chinese Zen Buddhism. <laughs> so they took away because they belonged to the old owner. So there are these kind of. Uh, a platform still there. I use them for putting my tent on. I did it too small. My tent stick now four direction, but it's big enough for me. That's why your brother was crying, thinking too small. I'm not small. I'm very small. I'm pocket size, traveling size. Mm. All right. So he became a monk. Yeah, shave hair, have a kasha. I roam in the ten directions, having no impeding obstructions. I discovered my spiritual penetrations, which are esteemed as unsurpassed, and I accomplished ahaship. So he has become a heart. But even then, can you imagine? Even then, he cannot forget to use his uh, magical power, which eventually led him to miserable death. Yeah. He continued. Not only the war honor one. But the thirst come ones of the ten directions praise my spiritual powers as perfectly clear and pure, masterful and fearless. The Buddha asked about perfect penetration by means of a spiral like attention to the profound. The light of my mind was revealed, just as muddy water clears. Eventually it became pure and dazzling. This is the foremost method. So that's uh, his uh, meditation method. Now, next monk. Any question about that? Anything I forgot to tell you? You see, he saw the light inside already. If you see the light, that means you're already in contact with the Buddha nature, no? That means you're enlightened already. Just that. But he has more. He has more than just seeing the light. So the Buddha certifies him as a heart. If you don't see the light, that means you're not anywhere yet except when you're in the fourth level and maybe it's dark over there for a while, and then you fumble around <laughs> and see your own light, then you'll be okay. Next monk, a chushma came before the Buddha, put his palms together, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, I can still remember how many cow passed ago. Oh, God, and we envious, no? Always there, remember all the cow paths, numerous. I was filled with excessive greed and desire. There was a Buddha in the world at that time named King of Emptiness. He said that people with too much desire turn into a raging mass of fire. He taught me to contemplate the coolness and warmth throughout my entire body. It's another method. So when he meditated on this method that the Buddha told him, a spiritual light coalesced inside and transformed my thoughts of excessive lust into the fire of wisdom. After that, 
when any of the Buddha summoned me, they use the name Firehead <laughs> because he has succeeded in transforming his desire, his lust into light. Therefore, maybe his head always emits light. They call him Firehead. <laughs> there was many cow paths. Yeah, past. From the strength of the fire light of Samadhi, I accomplished a hardship. I made a great vow that when each of the Buddhas accomplishes the way, I will be a powerful knight and in person subdue the demons' hatred. Maybe that's why he's born at the time of the Buddha now, in order to protect the Buddha and his disciples. Maybe he don't need to protect the Buddha, but protect the disciples that following the Buddha who are not yet powerful enough to subdue the demons. The demons always hang around the Buddha. Yeah, They do. They do like that. They also like to listen to Dharma, but some of them are so fierce. And if your level is not high enough, they might scare you mm? or harm you. They rub off something. <laughs> and not to talk about the demons and the, the Maya always hang around the Buddha to cause trouble. Yeah? Cause trouble for his disciples and indirectly Trouble the Buddha. Yeah, they do that all the time. The Buddha asked about perfect penetration. I used attentive contemplation of the effects of heat in my body and mind until it became unobstructed and penetrating and all my outflows were consumed. I produced a blazing brilliance and ascended to enlightenment. This is the foremost method. There's not much we can explain here, so I don't need my calendar. <laughs> Next one. The Bodhisattva name, Maintaining the Ground. This is some name, huh? <laughs> Arose from his seat. Maybe he's the one who taking care of the ground where the people meditate. Bow at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha, I remember when universal light, thus come one, appeared another Buddha, long time ago, in the world, in the past, I was a bhikshu who continually worked on making level the major roads. Ah, no wonder, that's why he's an engineer, soil engineer, making roads. <laughs> Ferry landings and the dangerous spots in the ground where the disrepair might hinder or harm carriages or horses. I did everything from building bridges to hauling sand. No wonder his name is maintaining the ground, just like goldsmith, <laughs> blacksmith, woodsmith, carpenter, yeah? Okay. Now, Buddha doesn't have any carpenter, Bodhisattva here. I didn't see it yet. But he has a soil engineer for sure here, yeah? <laughs> I was diligent in this hard labor throughout the appearance of limitless Buddhas in the world. Wow, so whenever any Buddha appears in the world, he also appears to level the ground, to maintain the bridge and repair the road. If there were beings at the walls and gates of the cities who needed someone to carry their goods, I would carry them all the way to their destination, set the things down and leave without taking any Recompense, and he don't charge money for that. He helped a lot of people. When the Buddha Vipassing appeared in the world, there was a worldwide famine. I would carry people on my back, and no matter how far the distance, I would only accept one small coin. If there was an ox cart stuck in the mud, I would use my spiritual strength to push the wheels and get it out of difficulty. Once a king asked the Buddha to accept a vegetarian feast. At that time, I served the Buddha by leveling the road as he went. Vipassi in come one rubbed my crown and said, you should level your mind ground, then everything else in the world would be level. <laughs> Immediately, at that time, my mind opened. As the Buddha said that, he blessed him also. So immediately, my mind opened up, and I saw that the particles of earth 
composing my own body were no different from all the particles of earth that made up the world. The nature of those particles of dust was such that they did not connect with one another, nor could they be touched by the blade of a sword. Wow, you know that, right? The atoms also, yeah. They look like they are thick together, but they are all separated. Even then you cannot touch them or you cannot separate them by the sword or a blade or anything. He saw that immediately, you know, I mean, the Buddha blessed him to have some glimpse of enlightenment, yeah? So, within the Dharma nature, I awakened to the patience with the non-existence of beings and phenomena and accomplished a hardship. I brought my mind back to the extent that I have now entered the ranks of the Bodhisattvas. Hearing the Thirst Come One proclaim the wonderful Lotus Flower Sutra, the level of the Buddha's knowledge and vision, I have already been certified as having understood, and I am a leader in the assembly of that direction. The Buddha asks about perfect penetration upon attentive contemplation of the body and the environment, I saw that these two dusts are exactly the same. Probably he saw the atom. Mm -hmm. That fundamentally everything is the treasury of the thirst come one, but that an empty falseness arises and creates the dust. When the dust is eliminated, wisdom is perfected and one accomplishes the unsurpassed way. This is the foremost method. So that's his method. Contemplate the body and the environment and split the atoms. <laughs> that means atoms were discovered way before science discovered them. Right? Yeah, the spiritual people know everything before science even begin. Yeah, all right. Okay, maybe another time. Take a rest, all of you also. <laughs> Thank you, Buddha. <laughs> we should really thank the past masters, monks and nuns and scholars who have taken time to record the Buddha's teaching after the masters and Nirvana. And also for the past and present persons, lay or monks or nuns who have really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time, and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. I can't believe I speak hours non-stop. I could not. Yeah, truly, because I don't know how, really. I normally don't like to speak at all. That's why I avoid to see people whenever I can, yeah? Thank you very much. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know if it's love or is it your desire or... We are so blessed, Master. Thank you so much. Because I tell you why. The other day, remember, we have a mantra for the uh, practitioner after the Buddha died. He said, you can make a, a mandala, you know, build a hut or a platform, and you have to sit there 100 days, no sleep, no eat, no drink, and recite what mantra, so that you can also become enlightened, just as when Buddha alive. And the mantra is about 20 pages. I didn't read it to you, remember? And then I thought I better practice reading it first at home. <laughs> it's translated. I don't know if it's really 100% effective, even if you do it nowadays with this mantra. If you did not encounter Kwan Yin Method and you want to do it according to Buddha instruction, I'm not sure if you can even sit 100 minutes, <laughs> not to say 100 days, and then without eat, without drink, without sleep, and recite that mantra. Yeah, but nevertheless, I thought maybe one day I will read it to you to complete that. It's supposed to have also some benefit, okay? But then, so I try to read it at home first, so that when I read to you, it's smooth. 
and not obstruct it. I read only half. I feel very, very tired already. And the next day, I read another half. I feel tired. One day, I try again to read. I try to read several times so that I become more used to it. Because a mantra is not like English, you know, words are not having anything to connect with your intellect or your logic. I try to read. I read uh, just maybe one time. That's it. I feel so tired already. I read loud, understand? Just reading even. Don't even have to think. Yeah. So tired. Shifu, can you speak a little bit? Say. Shifu, when I was asking for peace, 然后我要去印心的那个路上，我就往里面一直求，我就说师父，您是师父，我真心跟你求印心。那如果我累是修行的，对我解脱，对我真正修行没有帮助，请师父就帮我拿掉。那于众生有力的再帮我留下来。结果我印心出来，我以前我以前每天送大悲咒，然后往生咒那些咒。一个字都想不起来，一个字都想不起来，完全想不起来了。谁叫你乱求嘛？没有，可是可是我我因为修行以后，从内在自己得到的东西，不是这一世用头脑去学的东西，都在。OK， 所以我我我知道那个咒语没有用，因为那个咒语当初有用，是因为传法的那个人才有用，传法的才有用。对，是真的是这样。对，所以我我觉得我。根本都忘光了。<笑> okay. 我我一星前还一直在吃，我吃很多咒。了解。可是连最简单的都忘光了，都忘一干了净。对，然后连最简单的大悲咒，记得那个就好。我也统统忘记了。啊，记得那个就好了。我还记得一些了，不过我不常用，不用。嗯，像那个呃，喂那个恶鬼的时候，要念什么咒给他多多背出来的啊？那我是弄的。念十咒。啊，给他而已了，别的都。我记得也不用，嗯，好，谢谢，懂了，懂了。呃、uh, ，She just wants to tell you that even if I read that sutra, if I read it to you, it might not be useful, because before she initiates, she asks if if anything useless, then please delete it for her. She asks master to do that before initiation, and it's really she forgot everything. <laughs> Being a nun, you know many many mantras. You have to. Yeah, you have to know many mantra, but she forgot everything after initiation. Truly, all deleted, like computer. Yeah. <laughs> That's been. <laughs> okay, I see you maybe later, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. With your cramped legs and your <laughs> squeezy seat, you are patient. Thank you. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could sit there with such a long Western leg for hours. Thank you. All right, this is very young. She said because master blessing, but for them it's easy. They do that every day. Monks they meditate a lot. You know, before even they met me, they would have learned some meditation already. You know. Yeah, so for them, they sit long time, no problem. Yeah, for you, I really have respect, impressed. <laughs> Thank you.